Hello all you hardcore boxing fans out there, how are you doing? It's Big P here, and still the voice of hardcore boxing. Now, I'm trying to do something different today because from what I can see everybody's struggling for content aren't they? And they're all trying to do something different and blah de blah which is not wrong with that. Because this is not life and death, it's more than that. <laughs> So, I think today, let me just have a flick through my phone. Glyn Rhodes, let me phone him. He'll be struggling, Glyn, won't he, in house. He's used to being at his gym, is Six o'clock, well, ten o'clock, 16 hours a day, tied to a gym. <laughs> so, trust me, Glyn Rhodes will be struggling. So, let's give Glyn Rhodes, let's give Glyn Rhodes a, a, a ring. Here we go, let's have a look. See if he's all right. We've got a soft spot for Glyn. Hello. How are you doing? I'm all right, Ross. How are you? I'm all right. Are you coping with this? Uh... <laughs> for this being locked up, yeah. locked down, whatever you want to call it. I'm the uh, same as everybody else, Ross. It's not good, but it's for the best, and uh, it's, it's, got, it's what's going to be done. So yeah. just get your head down and get it done. Because how long you had your gym now, Glenn? Didn't you leave the Ingle Gym about 1993 or something? Uh, I didn't actually leave. I had my last fight in 1993, and I wandered around for about a year, not knowing what to do with myself. If you can imagine, I've been at Brendan since I was 16, yeah. and I retired at 33. So at yeah. 33, I had to go and get a job, um, which weren't easy, uh, because I never had a proper job. So I wandered around for about a year, and what actually happened is, um, I didn't have a job not too far from uh, where I lived, and I was walking up the street, and, uh, I saw the sign opening soon, fitness gym, body bar, boxing, uh, kickboxing, whatever, and I walked in and um, the guy's name was Steve Baxendale and he asked me, you know, if I wanted to teach boxing there, I, I gladly said yeah, and then that's basically the start of my career as a trainer. Oh, so is that the same guy who got stabbed? No, it was his brother. Steve used to own a nightclub in Sheffield, bit of a character. Called Niche. Um, um, and it was his brother who got stabbed and killed some, I don't know what happened there, but yeah. uh, I, I've got nothing but good things to say about Steve. He, uh, he obviously gave me a job to start with, mm. um, obviously I weren't making no money, so I worked on the door of his nightclub for a while as well, which were interesting. Uh, it was like one of these heavy rock clubs, um, it was, <laughs> and you know, there weren't much trouble. Uh, all these heavy rockers want to do is just have a good time. So uh, mm. he gave me a job in, in, in his gym and a job in the night working on, on his door. So Glyn Rhodes, the doorman, eh? Terry McCann of Sheffield. Oh, I won't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm definitely not cut out to be a doorman. Although I did work on a few doors, but uh, <laughs> that's another story. Did you work on one with Johnny Nelson? Do you know what? No, I didn't work on no Because he, didn't he work at Roxy? No, he worked, I think Johnny worked at a, a, a pub in Hillsborough. I think his, his girlfriend at the time, uh, dad owned a pub and he worked, he worked at, on the door of the pub. Because obviously when they had football matches, it gets packed to Hillsborough. And so yeah. he was that door on just to yeah. stop anybody getting in. And uh, how's, uh, how's your relationship with Ingle Jim since you moved on? Yeah, are you alright with him? Mm. I never fell out with Brendan. People get you know mixed up. Wow, thing is, I retired. Yeah. I retired. I shook Brendan's hand and I walked away. And then uh, we used to see each other at shows and various things. And then you know over the years we, we fell out over various things. You know, fires left his. But this yeah. is what happens in boxing. Yeah, yeah, fires, yeah. Fires left his gym, came to mine, and then me and Brendan never had a fallout. You know, we never. But something went off and people. Got involved and we never mm. spoke for a long time. Then 
we still saw each other at shows and things. And then one day, I kept missing Brenda. You know, I, I'd heard he'd been ill. And yeah. uh, I kept missing him. And one day, Killer said to me, Killer Khan, um, he says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, I'm going to make a very good speech to come down to the gym. Because we keep missing each other. You know, Brenda and I, they just come in or just go in. Um, and after spending so much time with Brenda, it was nice to... It would have been nice to sit down and have a chat with him, which we did. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I made this made arrangements for me to go down at gym, and it, it was good. I uh, walked in gym, and it was really, really strange walking into gym because it was a place that I'd been going since I was a kid, and so it, it all came flooding back to me the many years that I'd been walking through that big church door. Yeah. Um, and it seemed it was a bit surreal to tell you too. It, it, it was. They were a bit emotional as well to say it so because yeah. I had been going from 16 to 33 and then to not walk in the place for 25 years and go back I recognised it all and I had a laugh with Brendan about um, putting these RSJ girders in that you've got the bags hanging from we actually um, knocked an hole in the wall at the side of the gym and fed the, the lorry back up to the gym wall and we fed the RSJ girders to and we were stood on tables and chairs feed him across to the other side of the gym and I'm thinking if health and safety had come and saw what we were doing you know stood on tables feeding our SG girders to the other side of the gym oh yeah uh, the, the gym had got shut down but things, things we did things like that back in them days didn't we yeah 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 so anyway so what happened is um, they made, uh, I mean made arrangements for me to come down to the gym and uh, like I said it was, a bit, it was strange it was a bit surreal and it was really nice I walked in the gym, Brendan didn't see me at first, then Dominic stopped everybody training and introduced me to everybody because there were all new faces down there. I, I didn't hardly know anybody. There was a time when I walked in that gym and I knew everybody. You know, yeah. Brian, uh, knew, knew everybody. So when I walked in on this occasion, there were a few people I know, um, but uh, the faces were all different. Anyway, Dominic stopped everybody training and introduced me to Brendan and we had a chat, had, had pictures. He had his MBE, I had my MBE, so we had a few pictures and it was great and and then shortly after you know he took ill and died but the, I'm so glad that you know I went down to see him we had a chat about good old days and whatever, yeah. whatever and, and it was great and so like I say I'm happy that we, we did that before he, he yeah. before and passed on and do, and do you get away all other lads from the who, who you grew up with no uh, well I don't really the boxers you mean the boxers yeah yeah uh, I don't really know any of the boxers from down there they're a different era yeah. to me What, Mick Mills there? Yeah, Mick Mills one of the first. Mick Mills, John Kelly, Chris Walker, Lloyd Stewart. They, 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 these were the guys who were there before me. And then there was that era of the Bomber Graham era, which was a great era. And then all the guys who came after. You've got to remember, I think, when I, when I was 20 years old, I think Naz was about seven. Yeah. So I stayed there till I was 33. So I've seen all these guys, guys growing up. But once I got to 33 and retired, I never, I never went back to the gym for whatever reason. Uh, and so although you know these guys from hanging around boxing shows, I won't say they were my friends or anything like that. They're just you know people who yeah. met at boxing shows like everybody does. You know, yeah. I, I, I don't care what anybody says about the Ingle Gym. I was there at the best era. Because, yeah. Yeah. They had the, the nasty Malik years, but when Bono were boxing. Um, Fly into Johnny Nelson at a weigh-in a few years ago, and his wife jump on your back. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Is it one of them? <laughs> oh, we'll leave that one then. His wife. I'm friends with his wife on Facebook now. She's all right. She, uh, I think you have to have to shoot me with a right good shot. <laughs> well done, Debbie. 
Because did, did you have a did you have a nickname, Glyn, when you were fighting? You know, like the Entertainer or Bomber or all like that. My, my, my nickname was Showboat because I was always showing off. <laughs> the reason I used to show off is because I never used to show off until I got tired. Yeah. And then when I got tired, about round two, yeah. I started showboating, and that was to disguise the fight that, absolute, that I were absolutely knackered. Yeah. So I got the name Showboat, and it kind of stuck, and then I kind of reveled in it, and I enjoyed it, and so I used to show off. And I think sometimes I were more during my fights. If you've ever seen any of my fights, I was, I was more intent on showing off rather yeah. than in the fight. And yeah. now, right now, I think what an idiot. But anyway, mm. I had a good career. Yeah. And you obviously ended up training Bomber, didn't you, for his world title weight in America? Yeah, well, what happened is I trained Bomber for his comeback against uh, Terry Ford from America. And then I, I watched Bomber. You've got to remember, this is what people have got to remember. Like, I'd been with Bomber from being 16, seeing him come through the line, middleweight, middleweight. And then when he made his comeback and boxed a kid called Terry Ford from America who were drawn up like middleweight, mm. and Bomber struggled. I was one of the people who said to him, look, Errol, he's not there no more. He was coming up to four year old. I said, just forget about it and be a boxing trainer. And luckily, Bomber says, no, I'm going to carry on. I said, well, look, I can't, I can't tell you one thing and then just keep taking 10% off you and training you. So uh, what happened is, I was still training Errol, but Dean Powell was working in his corner. But then he boxed uh, Chris Johnson, um, Craig Joseph and Vinny Pazienza and then luckily Frank Maloney got him a shot at uh, Charles Ruff for the world, IBF world title yeah. what happened on that night Dean Powell couldn't go with him so he said to me look would I go with him and I thought well, yeah, you know, it's, it's pretty right on my toes because I've been friends with Errol from being kids yeah. so I said look it's Errol's last two rounds so to speak so I said yeah so I went with Errol to America great experience absolutely unbelievable um, that venue Atlantic City Convention Centre it's, it's seen some of the greatest fights in history yeah, so yeah. To, to go out there uh, with Errol I owe Errol so much yeah. not only that we we went and did a press conference in New York and then we flew to Miami and we trained in the same gym as Lennox Lewis because he was fighting Shannon Briggs at the top of the bill so you're in a gym with Errol Graham and training alongside uh, with, with Manny Stewart and things like that. So for a young kid like me who'd only been a trainer for a short time, it was a great experience. Um, so they all, like I said, I owe Errol Graham so much. I, I, I can't actually say that I have trained Errol Graham either. You know, I'm the same age as Errol, exactly. We were both born in 1959, so I didn't train Errol. You know, by the time Errol were boxing for world title, you know, all I used to do is take him on the pads and shout time and try and motivate him. But Errol Graham were uh, a one-off. He couldn't train Errol Graham. He did his own things. Sadly, he lost to Brewer uh, in a great fight. And, uh, you know, I don't know whatever you believe in, what kind, I don't know, but this is something Errol just were never meant to be world champion. He said, Cooks, he came so close against one of the all-time greats, Mike McCallum, yeah. and lost. Split decision on it, half a point. you ended up training Clinton Woods in America on a Dennis Hobson Don King show didn't you in the world title fight yeah.
time to be moved for the central area title against Darren Littlewood in Sheffield. Um, and the, the, the strange thing there was Darren Littlewood from Brendan's gym. And obviously I'm training Clinton. Clinton went on to win. And then I trained him for a few more fights in between. I trained him for the Mark Baker fight and that was for the Commonwealth title that were on the undercard to Errol and Pazienza. And then um, I trained him for his Oh, which I've trained for another couple of fights and then I trained for his last fight. So the story that I always tell about my relationship with Clinton is I trained him first for the Central Area title early in his career and I trained him for his last fight, the World title in Miami against um, Tavares Cloud. And, and then in between that, what a journey he had. Oh. You know, what, an unbelievable journey. And I always use Clinton as an example in my gym to the kids of a kid who... You know, he, 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 he'll tell you himself he weren't no Sugar Ray Leonard, but what he liked in one department, he made up for by sheer art, bottle, courage, chin, whatever you want to call it, and trained really, really hard. And so I, t I tell all my kids in the gym, this is the guy you've got to try and emulate, the guy you want to be like. No, trained hard, um, weren't no fancy Dan, but a great fire. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny actually because obviously I've spoke to Clinton at length about his career many times and Clinton used to say to me, I used to get up every single morning and do his runs. Now, you know where he lives, it's quite hilly, isn't it? Where he, he obviously lives up road from Dennis and there's them hills. It's just up and down, up and down, isn't it? And they do, he'd do his runs just like Carl Froch and obviously like Tommy Frank does. They don't miss the runs, do they? Once you start missing them, Glenn, it's over, isn't it? Exactly, listen. Yeah. You knew he'd done his run. You know. Yeah. And then you've got other fires in the gym who tell you they've done the run. <laughs> oh, like I used to, Brendan. Brendan yeah. used to say to me, have you been running? And I used to say, yeah, Brendan, I ran this morning. And then by round two, I couldn't hold my hands up. And Brendan must have been looking at me and thinking, you silly little sod. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Clinton is the type of fight. Like Tommy Frank, they don't change, they get it done. Tommy Frank's been winning the gym over this period of time when we've been on lockdown. And uh, I've got cameras in the gym, so I can see what he's been doing. Um, and I guess he just takes himself in the gym and gets on with it. And I think, you know what, what a role model. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's, got, he's got his head round it, hasn't he, Tommy? He's dedicated, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, great pro. Uh, I'm just speak, going back to Clinton, uh, do you think Clinton's coming out party or kind of the fight where they all said he's going to be a great fighter well, when he fought Crawford Ashley? Yeah, only Clement. Well, he sparred him, didn't he, in Norway, didn't he? Yeah, yeah I thought that was a tough fight for Clinton. Um, that's one of the fights that defined him, defined his, I think, anyway, because he wasn't supposed to win, and he did the right number on him. But yeah, uh, the other one, that, yeah, that's a great fight, because he wasn't supposed to win that way. Not no. gave him a chance to win that, and uh, he pulled it out of the bag, didn't he? Do you think Dennis matched him hard? Or do you think it was just an era where they were just tough, tough men? The era, yeah, the era that they were in, you know, fighters these days, some guys these days can become world champions by having easy fights. But having them easy fights and these unbeaten records and protected records and, you know, then when you're in a hard fight, it's such a shock because they've never been in a hard fight. Yeah. So these guys, you know, they get to the top and the first hard fight they have and they start asking themselves questions. They're thinking, you know, is this is this how it is? Whereas yeah. if you're having early fights in your career and they're pretty tough, and you're you're realising that you've got, you know, you're getting dropped like Clinton did against um, Crawford Ashley. Yeah. And you know, you, you realise then that some of these kids have got a big pair of coconuts, and they can get off the floor and come back. So when it happens to them during a, 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 a big fight, it's no big deal. But what happens when a lot of these fighters are protected? The first hard fight they have, they fall up. Yeah, it's. Uh, do you think sparring supposed to replicate all that, uh, Glyn? No. I don't, listen, I know that Clinton were tough. I didn't have to see Clinton spar to know he was tough. And some of the guys in the gym, I know they're tough. So I don't, I don't think you have to have hard sparring sessions to show you training or whether you promote that you're a tough kid. Yeah. You know, most kids do a box. You know, they're tough anyway because they're going to boxing, but some kids are tougher than others. Some have got, uh, you know, uh, bigger 
out than others, but I, I'm not one of these trainers who believes that you've got to have tough sparring. Don't you know? You've got to have competitive sparring, obviously, but yeah. uh, you can't replicate, no matter what you do in the gym, you can't replicate anything in the gym. What's going to happen during the fight? You know, you can go through it in your head what's going to happen and what you think will happen. But when you get it on chin, what's that famous saying that Mike Tyson said? Everybody has a plan till they get it on chin. Yeah. And that's right. You know, you can. We all go through these scenarios in your head. Oh, if this happens, I'll do this. And if this happens, I'll do that. But you get cracked on chin with a good shot. And listen, I remember Andy Oligan hit me on chin and in the first round, dropped me in the first round. I got up and finished and lost on points. And I got a, a, a VHS recorder, a, a tape of the fight after. And I watched the fight, and I honestly never knew he dropped me in the first round until I watched the fight. Never? I, I, did, I didn't even know I'd be. <laughs> that was bad, that, yeah. I didn't even know I'd be on the floor in the first round until I watched the video. And I, I thought, bloody hell. So, yeah, I'm not one of these fighters, trainers who thinks that you've got a hard fight into it, you know. Okay, in the gym. I don't like it. And the other thing as well, I don't like how sparring it because he's putting miles on your clock. Yeah. And the one thing that ruins a lot of fighters, in my opinion, is having too many wars in the gym. Yeah. You know, trainers, trainers that have no clue what they're doing, letting fighters have wars in the gym, getting busted up around the face and things like that. I just think it's ridiculous. You know, if you if you're going to be having wars, you want to be doing it on the night of the fight, not in the gym. Yeah. Do you think that there's a lot of trainers now coming into boxing, young trainers, and they don't want to learn the craft, they just want to get on social media, pal the champions yeah. up and, and get yeah. working with them? Yeah. The, the, thing, the thing that, uh, I, no, I don't know, listen, um, I, I do my fair bit of publicity and that, but there's some boxing trainers now, and they think they're more important than the boxers, yeah. you know, you, you, you see them doing interviews all the time, and, uh, like I say, I do my fair share, but I don't. I, listen, I'm not. But I'm all right. I'm, I'm where I am. But these these young trainers nowadays, some of them think they're more important than the boxers. Yeah. And, you know, you don't see you don't see the interviews from the boxers, but there's always a trainer there giving an interview, giving his opinion. Yeah. And sometimes they just have to smile and laugh to myself and think, you know. But hey, listen, whatever. Yeah. Uh, Sam Sheedy, you had Sam Sheedy took him to the Commonwealth. Yeah. That's another thing what I like about myself is, you know, we can all take these kids that have been on the um, England team and make them into yeah. champions and things like that. But what I've done is basically, you know, same as what Brendan did. You know, I get kids from Rowan Novices, Sam Sheedy didn't know his left foot from his right foot, took him all the way through the amateurs, uh, all the way through the pros and then won a, won a major title, you know. After, did he win? He boxed now three English area title Commonwealth yeah title. it were robbed against uh, Langford won he Wales yeah lost to Langford for the British title but I think that's what a good trainer does he takes a kid you yeah. know takes him all the way through from a real novice um, like Smedley like Chris Smedley did with Liam yeah took him through to, yeah that's right you know it's easy we can listen anybody could train somebody who's already good who well, from Olympics yeah an Olympic champion they're already good because what's What's happened is some bloke in a little smelly gym up and down the country has trained him week after week, you know, took him to amateur shows, um, you know, educated the kid, been there when he's been good, you know, put his arm around him and comforted him when he's had bad losses um, and took him right through. And I think that's what a good boxing trainer does. Not one of these who just gets a kid who's a ready-made prospect. Yeah, and there's too much of that going on. This is why I lose my cool all the time on the channel because... Yeah. I see it on a daily basis, I speak to people and I'm like, that people are getting fighters handed on a plate because they're, they're well in with other people, yeah. or they can get them on that's, TV. That's, yeah, that's boxing, that's, I, I don't know if it's always been like that, but... Um, you know, no, I don't think it's always been like that, I, I want to see some f trainers, there's too many trainers in the 20s, oh, I want to be a trainer and I'll pal so and so up and I'll, and I'll get him and do this because I know him and I can get him to that place because I'm in with a certain person. But when the push comes to push, they're playing with kids' lives because they only need to have a rough night or miss something that they don't like. That's Stan Richards, whatever it is, Stan Summit, McClellan's trainer. He missed them blinking, oh, yeah. didn't he? Listen, yeah, listen, that's brutal. I, I, I want to tell you... Years ago, 25 years ago, I went on a training course and a bloke said to me, I can't even remember his name, uh, it was an old box 
show them a chain and he said to me, Remember the kids you're training, they're somebody else's babies. And so yeah. look after them the way you'd expect your own kids to yeah. be looked after. And I always bore that, bear that in mind, it's 25 years ago. And so sometimes I've been involved in fights when I've chucked out into early, um, or I've stopped fights, or I've put kids out of fights, or whatever, whatever. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll stand by, I'll, I'll do it again, and I'll, I probably will do it again and again and again. Yeah. Um, but I always think, you know, I think it's better too soon than too late. Uh, yeah. you, know, you know the recent experience yeah. of every Scottish yeah. so yeah. it can happen. So I'm one of these, me. I think if I expect to be stopped too soon, you know, live to fight another day. Yeah. Uh, moving on then, John Fuchs, how's he doing? I think John Fuchs is doing absolutely brilliant. He's, he's, he's one of the best young boxing trainers out there and I'm not just saying that because he came through my, my gym from being a kid but he was with me from 11 years old took him all over the world he's, he's sparred in Vegas um, uh, Mike McCallum I'll tell you a story a few people sparring with his kid one day and Mike McCallum actually said to him he fights like a brother <laughs> 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 he fights like a brother uh, so Fuki's he's paid his dues he's, he's doing a really good job and I watch him now and I when I watch him, I smile to myself. Yeah. I hear him saying things that I said to him, or I see him doing things, and I think, you know what? He's going to make a good trainer. He is a good yeah. trainer already. I've he's already seen him close trainer. up on an amateur shows at Mick Wales gym. And he's very calm and collected in ring and that, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, he's going to make a good trainer. He's, he's doing a good job up at. He runs Dennis's amateur setup, doesn't he, up at Dennis's gym? Yeah, he's doing well. Yeah. I've got some great memories of John Fuchs and his family. His family have always backed him. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I call John Fuchs. I regard John Fuchs as one of my mates. Yeah, he's a good lad, John. Uh, let's finish off then on a bit of sad news. I don't like to talk about this, but Liam Cameron, you've probably heard, haven't you? Yeah. How yeah, sad is sad. that? It's terrible, isn't it? It's, 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 I don't Again, I don't know what the answer is. What's No, people are getting people are getting four year bans like Liam, and then we've got other people, two time cheats, and they, 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 they're not doing note about it. And Povetkin is he free time? It, it, it seems to be oh, oh, they're going after the small fry, hammering them to set a president. But if you've got big people behind you, it, it goes away, doesn't it? I just hope that Liam's alright and that he doesn't done out daft. Well, fingers crossed, let's hope. Yeah. He, uh, I, I think what Liam should do is what I'm, I'd like to see a lot of ex fighters do. You know, I never thought when I was boxing, all I wanted to do when I retired from boxing, I thought, that's me done, I'm out of here, yeah. I don't want to be a boxing trainer. But yeah. what I wish a lot of fighters would do is, I wish a lot of fighters would stay in the game and become trainers. Yeah. I think that's what he needs in this game, it needs more. Xboxes, yep. yeah. becoming trainers, you know, teaching young kids, you know, learning from their experiences. Yeah. And I think Liam would, would be good at that. He's, he's a good kid to get along with. Um, and I think he'd make a great trainer. Yeah, I do. I do. But uh, let's wish him all the best. Right, well, that's been brilliant, Glyn. You're always a good guest on Porky's Corner. We say it as it is. I hope the questions weren't too hard for you. That's a problem sometimes. I always say it as it is. Yeah, you do. We're not bothered, are we? We can live with that. Nobody ever does that anyway. It's all smoke and mirrors. Listen, forget that. I mean, sorry for my language, but listen, Ross, you stay safe. Yeah. I'll speak to you soon. You take care, my friend. Take it easy. Bye. Bye. And that was Glyn Rhodes. That was his story. Very interesting. Glim Rhodes MBE. So, peace out. Keep on trucking. Keep supporting boxing. 
Shout out to Weak Wellins and Smido and Ozzy from the Boxing Asylum. 